Christian life, it is a marathon and it is not a sprint. We, we're called to go the distance until the Lord takes us home. And we need to be so very careful that we lay aside everything that could weigh us down. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Today, a message called Running the Race to the End. And, you know, if we want to run that race well, as you say, Jonathan, we don't want to be carrying extra baggage, extra weight. What are some of the common things that you see that often do weigh us down? so interesting, isn't it, to consider that and to consider our own Christian life and to look in the scriptures as well. The, the call here in Hebrews 12, which, which you're referencing, is the call to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And there are things in, in life which are maybe not sinful in and of themselves, but they are weight on the journey, things that we just don't need to have in, as encumbrances in our lives. And and maybe it's, maybe it's material possessions. We just got too many and they're slowing us down. Maybe we've got just too many involvements in life, you know, hobbies and interests, and they're, they're fine in and of themselves, but maybe they're slowing us down in the race because we don't have time for the Word of God and for service and for investing in, in relationships within, within the family of Christ and so on. So those can be things that weigh us down, but then there will also be sins that entangle us, and we know there are certain things in our, in our life that are not right and we need to repent of and set aside so that we can keep running that race. And it'll be different for each one of us, but it's certainly something that each one of us who know Jesus and who walk with Jesus, we need to be, we need to be giving prayerful, careful consideration to that. And I think this time in Hebrews 12 will help us to do that. Well, grab your Bible and join us in Hebrews 12 then. We're looking at the first couple of verses there as we begin this message, running the race to the end. Here is Jonathan. Well, it's one thing to start a project. We all know it is quite another thing to finish it. I love new projects, whether it's a new ministry project or a new home improvement project or even a new fitness project. There's a thrill about starting on that first morning. The, the second morning can feel pretty exhilarating. Uh, the project, it's still fresh on day two. Uh, the, the third morning, well, it can take that extra cup of coffee or whatever to sort of get going, but you're still invested, you're still enthused. Uh, the fourth morning, the, the fifth morning, the, the second week, the third week, and on it goes. Sometimes the sheen wears off just a little. Sometimes the energy wanes. We all know that experience. It's much easier to start just about anything than it is to finish it. It's one thing to start the race of the Christian life, to set off with enthusiasm, following Jesus, serving Jesus, obeying his word, loving his people, making sacrifices, bearing costs to do those things. It's one thing to start. It's another thing to continue, another thing to finish. And we all know something of the challenge of that. If we've been following Jesus for any length of time, we, we know the challenge of just keeping going day by day, trusting him, reading his word, seeking to serve him in the ordinary things of life. And, and when trouble comes, when opposition appears, when suffering comes knocking at our door, when our world is shaken by a pandemic, perhaps, when these things come, the challenge just to keep going in the Christian life, the, the challenge to keep running that Christian race, it can actually seem more than we're able to manage. And so it's a question all of us need to consider. It's a question that all of us need help in answering. How are we going to keep going? How are we going to endure? Here at the opening of chapter 12, Hebrews paints for us a vivid picture of the Christian life. He takes us to a great stadium with a long racetrack, and he invites us to imagine ourselves as runners on the track, enduring a long and a grueling race. This is no mere sprint, but this is a full-length marathon. 
The sun is hot above us. Our legs are feeling the strain. Our chest is tight with exertion. Jesus is, is at the finish line, and we've still got some distance to cover. What is going to keep us going right to the end? These two opening verses of Hebrews 12 really cap off the great lessons of chapter 11. This section, really, of Hebrews began with a call to endure, hinting toward this athletic imagery to come. You'll remember that call at the end of chapter 10. Let me just refresh our memory for a moment. Chapter 10 and verse 36, the writer says, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay." But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That's what Hebrews is interested in here. To call us and to help us to endure right to the end, living by faith. And all those wonderful models of faith there in chapter 11, they were there to help us do this very thing. So now here at the start of chapter 12 comes a summary call, encouragement, exhortation, and within it, I think we're given three key insights, three key principles for enduring in faith. I'm going to mention them now, and then we'll walk through them together. How do we run this race right to the end? Well, we listen to the witnesses, we lay aside every weight, and we look to Jesus. Those are the three components that Hebrews gives us here for enduring in the Christian race. Let's start with the first of those. To run this great race right to the end, we listen to the witnesses that have gone before. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. In a sense, this mention of the witnesses, this cloud of witnesses, it, it is on one level a matter of preamble and background to the call that's coming at the end of verse 1. But the mention of these witnesses, it is significant here. The writer is telling us that these witnesses, all the people of chapter 11, those great heroes of faith, their stories and their testimony are key for us if we are to keep going. I have to say, one person I don't envy at the present time is the Prime Minister here in Canada. Uh, leadership is always hard, but leadership in a time of crisis is especially daunting. And, and that level of senior national leadership, it must be quite lonely. There's only one Prime Minister of any given country at any given time. And so the number of people who would really appreciate and really understand the challenges and the pressures that the Prime Minister faces, uh, that, that number is very few. I've always sort of appreciated and enjoyed the fact that in the main corridor of the center block of Parliament and on, on the west side, the walls are lined with portraits of former prime ministers. Maybe you've been in and you've seen that. It's quite interesting, actually, to study those portraits and to get a bit of a sense for those leaders. Now, I don't know, of course, but I, I imagine that it probably does the current prime minister some good to walk down that corridor and to see those portraits, just to remember the stories of those leaders who have gone before, to consider what it must have been like for Sir Robert Borden to lead the nation through the First World War, or for William Lyon Mackenzie King to lead us through the Second World War. When things seem hard, when crisis strikes, remembering the stories of those who have gone before, walking through that gallery, it must be something of a help. It, it must encourage. It must aid endurance. Hebrews has just led us through a wonderful gallery showing us believers of old who lived that life of faith often through tremendously hard times, often in the face of potentially crushing obstacles. Remember what we heard, verse 37 of chapter 10. This is just a snapshot. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. We can get just a little bit tripped up on verse 1 of 
chapter 12. We can wonder here if the writer is talking about a, a cloud of witnesses who are at the present time witnessing our race, maybe watching us from heaven above. Is, is that the main point that the writer is making here? It would be an intriguing idea that the saints of old who have now died are watching us even today. If so, what would we make of that idea, which doesn't seem to have a whole lot of other support in, in the Scriptures? In the original, in the Greek, just like in the English, a witness can either be someone who watches something, a witness of an event, a, perhaps a witness of a crime or something, or it can be someone who bears testimony about something. We, we often talk about Christians as those who witness to the truth of the gospel and to the goodness of Jesus Christ. And when we speak of someone being a witness in that sense, we, we mean that they are those who have something to say, to, something to share about Jesus to the world around us, something to proclaim about the Lord uh, to anyone who will listen. Now, we've just spent a whole big long chapter, chapter 11, hearing the stories of faith of these saints of old. We've been listening to their testimonies of faith. And it seems quite clear that here in verse 1 that the focus is on these Old Testament believers as those who witness to God's faithfulness as they trust in Him. They have something to teach us, something to tell us, something to share with us. The point is not so much that they are witnessing our race, observing our race, although we're going to meet them at the finish line there in heaven. The point, the emphasis at least, seems to be that they have a story to tell us. They have an experience of the life of faith to relate to us for today. And Hebrews reminds us that we run the Christian race, as it were, along a track surrounded by portraits, stories, testimonies of those who have gone before us, who have now arrived safely at the destination. And friends, we need to hear their stories. We, we need to listen to their testimonies of faith. Hebrews 11 is such a rich and a wonderful chapter for us because it crystallizes for us some of the most amazing testimonies of faith from the Old Testament Scriptures. But, but we need to look beyond Hebrews 11, of course. We need to be those who immerse ourselves in the stories of the Bible, who do that basic thing of just observing how these believers of old lived as followers of the one true and living God. Of course, we need to read our Bibles and develop our, our Christian worldview and our biblical theology, and we need to see how all the stories of the Old Testament point to Christ and find fulfillment in Him. We, we need to read our Old Testament with all those theological lenses on, of course, and we need to be asking all those very important questions. But at the same time, we need to do that very simple thing of listening to the stories observing the people within the stories and learning from the godly people within the stories what it looks like to live day by day as the people of God through all the ups and downs of life. I fear sometimes that our reading of the Bible and our study of the Bible can get just a little bit too complicated and maybe a little too clever. We, we look out for the, the deeper things and we forget to just hear those testimonies of faith and to learn from those models of faith. I'd give this as an encouragement for parents as well. When you teach your children the Scriptures, when you read the Scriptures with your children, don't ignore the stories because you're simply driving at the theology. Don't, don't ignore the character studies, the basic models of the life of faith. We need to be those who have a rounded understanding of the basic character of the life of faith. Th that's a big part of the reason why all those stories are there in the first place. Times have changed since the Old Testament era, of course. Our context is different in all kinds of ways. But, you know, the human heart is the same. And God, He hasn't changed at all. So there are rich, relevant fresh lessons for us to learn about what it looks like to know this God and trust this God and to walk with Him. 
Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and a message called Running the Race to the End. Now we're going to pause right here, but we'll come back to this message in just a moment. Glad you've tuned in today. If you have just joined us, we're in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, we're looking at how do we faithfully run this Christian race to the end. We'll, like I said, get back to this in just a moment. But if you ever miss a broadcast or you just want to go back and listen to it again, do that at our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, let's get back to it. Again, here is Jonathan. I have to say, in times of trial or difficulty, it is such an immense help just to go back and, and, and read the story of Abraham or the story of David, or the story of Daniel. And just to remember that God's people have faced times of challenge and trial and difficulty before now. And God has been gracious to pick them up when they've stumbled, and they have stumbled. And and He's been gracious to sustain them when it seemed like they might faint on the way. He's been gracious to give them faith when they, they've needed to endure. And as I look at that, and as I'm reminded of that in the Scriptures, I'm helped by the Spirit of God to think, yes, by His grace, I too can keep going. So, friends, take the encouragement, if you would. Listen to these witnesses of faith in the Scriptures. Read their stories. Learn from their example What a wonderful thing to do in lockdown, (laughs) to say, you know, I'm just going to read through some of the great narratives of the Old Testament, and I'm going to deepen my understanding of what it looks like to live by faith. If we're going to run this race right to the end, we need to listen to the witnesses, and next, we need to lay aside every weight. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. When you're wanting to go the distance, it's important, isn't it, to travel light. Uh, When things are normal and stuff is open around town, one of the things we love to do is, is go to the museums. And we love going to the Aviation Museum here in Ottawa. And we love seeing the wonderful collection of heritage airplanes that they have there. I'm always fascinated by planes. I've said that before, and I I, I take an interest in any type of plane. But I have to say, some of the very earliest aircraft in the collection always tend to kind of catch my attention at that museum. Not because they're especially beautiful or technologically sophisticated. Actually, they capture my attention because they're so very basic. I actually feel just a little bit nervous even looking at some of them. The thought that people entrusted their lives to these really very flimsy and fragile pieces of engineering, these early biplanes, it's really quite remarkable. But the earliest planes were characterized perhaps above all other things by the extremes that their designers and builders went to to try and reduce their weight. A number of the early planes in this particular collection actually have wings that are covered not in metal or in wood, but but covered with canvas to make the thing fly and to allow it to cover the distance. Every weight was set aside and cut down, reduced. And so these early planes, they took to the skies carried by wings of mere cloth and nothing more. If you've ever gone for a hiking expedition, perhaps in the Rocky Mountains, or if you've ever embarked, on, ever embarked on a long canoe trip in the wilds of northern Ontario or Quebec, you'll know something about the discipline of packing light. I remember going on a long canoe trip, a 10-day trip as a teenager, and before we embarked on the trip, we had to gather all our belongings for those 10 days, everything that we were intending to carry, and we had to demonstrate to the expedition leaders that every single item would fit in our backpack. Not a single extra thing could come. It, It seemed tough at the beginning to have to face that kind of discipline and to have to remove things that you thought were essential for those 10 days. But of course, a few days into the expedition, we were very grateful for that early discipline. 
Christian life, it is a marathon and it is not a sprint. We're called to go the distance day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, decade by decade until the Lord takes us home. And we need to be so very careful that we lay aside everything that could weigh us down and slow us down. For the saints of old in chapter 11, they had to make some hard decisions about the things they would value and the things in this life that they would no longer value. Abraham, he had to let go his hold of, on his parents' homeland. Moses, you'll remember, had to set aside the treasures of Egypt and the privileges of the royal household. And for us today, it may be that there are some things in this world, some dreams, some priorities, some treasures, some attachments, some things that maybe are not wrong in and of themselves, but as we look at them in the cool light of day, we see that they are just slowing us down in the Christian race. Maybe for you, I don't know, maybe it's career ambition. It's not that your job is bad in and of itself or undermining of your faith in what you're doing, but your ambition to progress and to rise higher on that career ladder. Well, it's just filling your heart and it's absorbing your time and your attention and your energy. And it's doing so in such a way that over time, you're noticing that your Christian growth is being stunted. Your, your time in the Word, your ability to pray, it's all a bit limited and you, and you know it. And so just maybe your ambition is a weight that needs to be set aside. Maybe for you, it's your sport commitments. Maybe you play on teams, and actually you're pretty good and, and you love it. But practices and games and tournaments, those things, they take up evenings, and they fill weekends, and they intrude on Sundays. The sport itself, it's fine, it's wholesome, it's good. But the commitment and the degree of the commitment, it's dragging you away. <laughs> it's stunting your growth. It's slowing you down. Maybe it's your pastimes. Maybe it's as simple as Netflix and Facebook and Spotify. These things not necessarily all bad in themselves, perhaps, but you look at the time and the energy you invest and you see, you know what, this is slowing me down a bit. This is a weight in my Christian life at the present time. And either it needs to be reduced or it needs to be cut out, but something's got to change here. Maybe it's your possessions. Maybe you just have too much stuff and maintaining it and caring for it and paying for it. It's just filling your life and it's consuming your energy and your attention. None of it is evil or necessarily wrong in itself, but the effect on your Christian life as you consider it over time is just to slow you down a little bit. It's to stunt your growth. It's to limit in some way your service of Jesus Christ. And maybe as you think about that in light of Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, maybe you realize that's got to go. Something's got to change. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Running the Race to the End. We're taking a look at the first couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 12 today. Don't worry, we'll continue this message next time. If you know you can't be by your radio, though, you don't have to miss Jonathan's teaching. You can actually go back and listen to any broadcast at our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book written by Colin Smith. It's called Heaven, How I Got Here. It's the story of the thief on the cross. And really, it's a great look at how we can know for sure what it takes to get to heaven. How we can know that our sins can be forgiven and that we will spend our eternity not separated from God, but with Him for all of eternity. We'd love to send you a copy of this book, which also can be a great evangelistic tool. 
Give a gift of any amount, and we'd be happy to send it to you. Our website to give is EncounterTheTruth.org, and our phone number is 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us next time.